biggest legacy for, that I see for Sir John Murray is the establishment of the discipline of oceanography. Uh, he brought the topic really into the, well now the 21st century. Um, we think he was probably the first person to actually use the word oceanographer um, and oceanography to describe the science of the sea. It had been called various things before then. In, indeed, um, probably the first use of the word on a tombstone is that which appears on Sir John Murray's tombstone in Edinburgh. Um, and so I think it's that, that certainly, in my opinion, um, is that he, that he created the, what we now call um, the science of oceanography. My understanding is that he left uh, school in Canada, where he was for uh, his childhood, and decided to come as a teenager to Scotland to study with his grandfather, uh, whose name was Farland. But his grandfather was very interested in, in the sciences and was happy for him to uh, learn about science himself and to help him with the development of the Natural History Museum uh, project which he was developing in Bridge of Allen. And so he came there, studied at Stirling High School and after some while uh, left to go to Edinburgh University. Sir John was always a independent-minded and very adventurous student, I think. He didn't believe that study should be about exams. He was very keen to study everything that he could um, and develop a knowledge, a sort of whole knowledge, a holistic possibly knowledge of um, the world. He made a, a lot of friends. Robert Louis Stevenson was one of his uh, university friends who I think, although he himself, I gather, was not a brilliant pupil, despaired of Sir John. Uh, John as he was at that time, and declared that, that he thought John was a wandering star. He didn't uh, think that John was ever going to make it as, as a sort of serious person, a serious scientist. How wrong he was. John Murray was in fact not first choice um, as a naturalist on the Challenger expedition. Um, he was a student at the time at Edinburgh University and there was a the very last minute um, uh, the naturalist dropped out but Murray had so impressed one of the professors um, at Edinburgh University who was a friend of Wyville Thompson and Wyville Thompson was the leader of the Challenger expedition that his name was put forward as a last minute alternative and so he it was really quite a, um, a stroke of luck in many respects that Murray actually sailed on the, on the ship. During the, 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 the expedition what he, he did was, he was the primary naturalist but also he introduced um, some work uh, which has actually stood the test of time to this day where he collected sediment samples, so uh, many thousands of sediment samples from around the ocean um, and the description of those sediments the different types of deep sea sediments we still use today and so his legacy um, in just in that small piece of work was really important. When I was studying at the Natural History Museum, I was um, studying taxonomy and biodiversity and we had one day where we were working um, with the collections, um, experiencing life as a curator for the day and I was helping to top up the um, specimen jars in the, 
in the sort of spirit collection, there's the wet collections in the zoology department, and I was assigned a random cupboard to do this work and came across um, some jars that were uh, specimen jars collected from um, by the Challenger expedition. So I was um, then faced with these these jars that had potentially contained specimens that had been handled and, and collected and, and catalogued and described by my great-great-grandfather. So it was a really special moment. The reports and the work to be carried out after the expedition was initially to be managed and led by um, Wyville Thompson, the leader of the expedition. But the demands of that work and his Wyville Thompson's um, increasing ill health meant that Wyville Thompson took um, a backstage and eventually gave up and died. Um, and John Murray uh, then took over the entire leadership of the uh, production of the reports, which was an immense task. They insisted that the material were looked at by the most appropriate expert, whether they be from Britain or abroad. Uh, it was really a very much an international undertaking and scientists from all over the world visited Edinburgh to look at the material and help sort it. So it became a, a, a centre of international cooperation for many years. And 32 Queen Street is perhaps the address that is most commonly associated with the Challenger office. The presence of the Challenger offices in Queen Street in Edinburgh meant that there were visitors from all over the world beating a path to the Challenger door. Certainly within marine science and probably in any science it was, it was perhaps the first example of a massive international effort um, being driven towards a single aim and there are many commentators have, have actually commented that when the work was done the um, this, this community of international scientists really propelled uh, marine science into the future and led to the establishment of um, marine labs all the way around the world. And as we know, it's the, the, the reports in the end came out to be a massive 50 volume tome, beautifully produced, um, all driven by John Murray's indomitable energy and power. And, paid for at some considerable expense um, of his own. While Murray uh, and the staff of the Challenger office were working on the material from the expedition, they uh, had a number of students coming in and helping and they also had other assistants working perhaps part-time and Murray was very conscious that these people should perhaps have an opportunity to um, keep their hand in in terms of marine science and that is why he was probably delighted when the funding from the profits of the International Fisheries Exhibition of 1882 enabled him to get involved in the setting up of the Scottish Marine Station for Scientific Research at Granton. Again, that is perhaps most commonly associated in the popular mind with the Ark. The, the Ark was actually at Granton only from 1884, um, when it was actually officially opened in April, um, until the summer of 1885. And together with a, a steam yacht which John Murray himself owned, the Medusa, they would carry out surveys in the Firth of Forth, and in fact actually from the the Tyne up to the Spey uh, rivers. It's said that um, John Murray, however, preferred the west coast of Scotland, and so ultimately um, both the Medusa, the steam yacht, and the Ark were moved over to the west coast of Scotland and um, to the island of Cumbrae um, in the Firth of Clyde. So the centre for the coastal uh, marine science, which John Murray was very interested in, um, then moved over to the west, west coast. Um, which ultimately then led to the um, establishment of the Scottish Marine Biological Association, um, now SAMS, of course, um, in Oban. One of the aspects of John Murray's career was that he did have a kind of uh, entrepreneurial side to him. He suspected that there may have been opportunities to develop 
phosphate. And the reason he suspected this was because he had a debate with Darwin, I believe, about the formation of coral reefs. This is an academic debate which took place at the time. He commissioned some samples to be taken from Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean from the corals in order to explore this, his theory, which was in conflict with Darwin's. When studying those samples, he realized that there was phosphate uh, in the samples, and he thought there was an opportunity there to develop a business, essentially. And so he set up a, a company called the Christmas Island Phosphate Company and proceeded to develop a business which proved over a period of time to be profitable in the early part of the 20th century. And this was an, a kind of counterpoint to his uh, academic and scientific work. One of the key points, I think, which he was always very proud of, is that the British government received in uh, various fees and royalties and so on, more money uh, than they had spent on the original Challenger expedition. He became relatively wealthy because of the, the success of the Christmas Island um, company. Um, but he put a lot of that money back into science. Um, he um, carried on um, it right towards, towards the end of his life in, in funding expeditions, uh, the Johanna Hort expedition, uh, for example, um, he funded and himself was um, on board the vessel uh, right up until um, just a year before his death he was proposing um, an expedition to the uh, Pacific Ocean. Sir John Murray was um, an amazing polymath really. I mean we most people re remember John Murray for the work of the Challenger and the legacy of the Challenger and so on but um, he was a remarkable scientist in um, many, many disciplines. He um, conducted uh, really quite um, an amazing um, survey of um, Scottish locks, for instance. So he was, not only was he a marine scientist, but he was a, a, a notable limnologist too. He was very interested in meteorology and in fact helped establish uh, the observatory on top of Ben Nevis. He was uh, very forceful in the promotion of the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, ICES, uh, which today still is the scientific organisation which uh, controls the scientific in evidence that goes into setting commercial fish quotas, for example. Following his death, he um, ensured that uh, there was a significant legacy went into science to support particularly young scientists. He was very keen on, on the next promoting the next generation of scientists and his range of scientific interests um, was really quite remarkable. John Murray was of the highest intelligence and his mind travelled eagerly over a wide field of study. Indeed in the history of science he was one of the last examples of the universal naturalist. He had great organising ability and in character was singularly straightforward and transparently honest, direct of purpose and with great common sense. In manner he was downright, in speech plain, emphatic and sometimes brusque and domineering. But he had a real sense of fun and a store of kindness and good-heartedness, especially towards those who worked for him. His was a personality that could not be overlooked in any company.